Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on how to draft your first petition. My name is Tierra Thomas, and I'm the member of DAYL's Small and Solo Firm Committee. Um, we put together this program to provide the foundational yet untaught basics of preparing petitions. Um, should you have any questions during today's program, feel free to use the Q&A function um, located in the center bottom of your screen. The course number is 1740900338, and it has been approved for one hour of CLE credit. The course ID is also noted on the PowerPoint and will be provided again at the end of the program. In order to receive CLE credit, you must self-report. Our speakers today are three incredible in uh, attorneys. We have Andy Jones with Sawiki Law Firm. Um, Andy Jones, excuse me, Andy Jones is a trial lawyer at Sawiki Law. He focuses his practice entirely on plaintiff's personal injury cases. Andy has been named a D Magazine Best Lawyer Under 40 for the past two years and was named one of the only eight super lawyers rising stars for plaintiffs medical mail practice in Texas in 2020. Andy is board certified in civil practice advocacy by the National Board of Trial Advocacy and he is the president of, sorry, vice president of DAYL. We also have Amanda Saputo. She's a defense attorney focused on product liability, trucking and transportation and premises liability at Heartline Barger. Her product liability practice focuses on design and manufacturing of vehicles and glass bottles, while both her premises liability and trucking and transportation practice range from minor accidents to um, fatality incidents. And last but not least, we have Adrian Bauer. He's a plaintiff side litigator and the managing attorney at Bauer PLLC. He has been recognized as D Magazine's best lawyer under 40 and a super lawyer's rising star. Adrian is active in the bar, co-chairing the solo and small firm committee and expanding professional interest um, committees. Um, I'll now turn it over to the speakers. Well, all right, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're here on the drafting your first petition essential but untaught skills. Um, we're gonna begin here by talking about um, what court to file in. That's, that's the first question I typically ask myself before I you know, get down to the brass tacks of what I'm gonna plead and where I'm gonna, you know, how I'm gonna plead it. And so uh, as many of you know that the, there are a lot of options on what courts to plead in and you have everything from, you know, and I'm speaking from a Texas perspective here, um, you have your JP small claims, you have your state, district and county, you even have probate courts. Um, you also have your federal courts. And with each of those comes the unique questions. Um, you know, JP, your damages are capped at $10,000. Do you not want to have a record and automatically be appealed to the county court? Um, in Dallas, we have concurrent jurisdiction. So your district courts and your county courts can hear everything that's the same, can hear everything the same with some exceptions. And then federal courts, I mean, everything from diversity to federal question, a lot of stuff is important there to recognize. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts that you probably learned in CivPro. But if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about state court, which is where I spend most of my time, and specifically the questions I ask myself before deciding whether to file in county court at law or in, you know, in district court. Now, it's important to look first at your damage model because here in Texas, there are courts that do have limits on damages for your county courts, not in Dallas, but in other courts and uh, other counties. And then the other part about that is, is the legislature just changed the law. So if your damage model is, I think it's, a, you know, 250 or above or something like that, you no longer get the six person jury, you get the 12 person jury. And so balancing the question of caps and jury size, you really have to figure out that question. Another question is, is the complexity of your case versus docket size. County courts at law do appeals for eviction appeals, JP appeals, their docket is slammed. And so when you walk in with your multiple party medical malpractice case, you may be sitting in the back, in the back, of, the, back of the gallery waiting for JP appeals to finish. And so 
you've got to take that into account for county court versus district court. Now, district court, the danger is in another county, not Dallas, but in other counties, they offer general jurisdiction courts. Those are the courts that hear family and criminal and civil all in one court. And so if you have a, you know, if you have a, a complex business civil case and you want it to, and you need to file it in a general jurisdiction court, you may be sitting behind criminal and family law cases. Um, and so that, that presents another balance there. So it's really key to know what the nature of the forum is. It's really key to know is general jurisdiction, what's the docket like, and also turning to the run of the mill or change of pace, you do have to kind of know who your judge is. Um, especially in a general jurisdiction court where they have in counties that are not as large as Dallas or Tarrant or, uh, you know, things like that. Um, I have seen, uh, I have personal experience going to a general jurisdiction court out in East Texas where the judge is a civil practitioner. And so he enjoyed when we came down for our medical malpractice case because that was his area of practice and he enjoyed seeing that again. And so it, it got the court's interest, got the court motivated in understanding our issues and really helped move the case along, even though we did have to wait till the end of the criminal docket playing jail or no jail the whole day. But um, that can work to your advantage or cannot work to your advantage, depending upon what side of the V you're on or what you're trying to accomplish. Knowing your judge, knowing the docket and knowing the forum are essential to figuring out which one to plead in. Um, one other thing I'd say about the how many jurors you need, um, that is a question of, of liability facts and of your damage model. It's, it's, it's not something you think about up front, but, you know, I think, I think many people say, well, you know, if my case isn't the greatest, maybe it's easier to convince six people than it is to convince 12. Um, you know, that's a, that's a consideration you may want to, may ask yourself, but you can't forget that that also means that you'll have to look at your damage model as well. Uh, because then you're looking at, okay, I need six jurors, but maybe I have to cap my damages in county court. Um, one, other, one more thing I'd say about special rules and human factors. Um, a district court is the only court, as far as I remember, that can adju adjudicate land title. So even though you have an overlapping jurisdiction with county and district in a lot, of, a lot of counties, you still have to go to district court for land title. And so make sure you, you know what your case is about and if there are any special rules. Some counties, I think Rockwall, where um, they, don't have a, they don't have a jurisdictional limit on their county court, but they just have a policy that anything over 250 goes to the district court anyway. You really have to know those kind of things, which bleed into the human factors, which are you do need to know what's going on in that courthouse, who the, who the court clerks are, what are the specific preferences of the judges, um, to really kind of get the right, to get the right forum. Now, that is the last thing you do after going through the bigger questions, which are about your damage model and the complexity of your case. So um, I'd be happy to answer more questions on that at the end, but that's what I've got on that. So let's go to the next one. Um, as to discovery control plan, we all know the rule, 19.1. Uh, 190.1 says every case, you got to have a discovery control plan and plaintiff, you have to allege it in the first number paragraph of your petition. That's really important, y'all, because plaintiffs control the discovery at the outset. You plead what it is, and unless the defendants really put up a fight and want to change that, or the court does, you've picked it and that's what you got to go with. And so, um, as we know all the different levels, I want to talk about some of the questions that I ask myself before choosing a discovery control plan. So next one, please. Everyone's heard the Shakespeare quote, fortune favors the bold. So when you're looking at level one, level two, level three, you, if you're the plaintiff, you want to pick one that gets you adequate time for discovery, but moves the case to conclusion. My favorite, uh, my favorite thing about level one, uh, I, I, I liken it to be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. Um, level one is a very aggressive, uh, fast paced uh, discovery schedule tied to the expedited action rules. 
you should not be afraid of this, especially if you're a plaintiff or if you're a defendant with a counterclaim and can have some say in um, the nature of discovery. Um, it has a lot of good positives, especially for the right case. And you've picked the right case because you've done your analysis on uh, your damages model at the outset when you picked your court. Now you know, okay, the size of this case means I could move quickly. I don't need experts or, you know, I don't, I, I don't need, you know, two and a half years to do discovery. Um, level one on a small case, this is a very aggressive schedule, but a very good one. The downside to level one is it does provide limits on discovery. 15 ROGs, 15 RFPs, 15 requests for admission. It limits the amount of uh, time you get at trial and limits the number of depositions you take, but it gets you through the process faster and gets you to a borderline fixed trial setting. You can only get it continued once or twice within a certain amount of time. So um, that's where that's, that's the up and down on that one. I'm sure there's going to be a later slide about the fact that in an expedited action, you also get a bonus request for, dis request for disclosure, which is essentially give me everything you got which is great because then that limits the number of RFPs you end up having to send out because it says uh, 194, whatever it is for expedited actions, says you have to turn over all the stuff you're going to use to support your claim or defense. And so that's another added bonus of level one. But that's if you're comfortable being bold and waiting for mighty forces to come to your aid. Um, level three is where a lot of us spend our time. Uh, level three is a scheduling order that's tailored specifically to your case by the court. Now, in my experience, courts love it when, def when plaintiffs and defendants agree on their level three scheduling orders. Bonus points if you can incorporate whatever the court uses in their traditional or, or in their standing scheduling order. The advantage of scheduling orders is if you've properly thought through your case, you're going to know the flow of your case, you're going to know when things are due, and you're going to get the discovery you need and the time you need it in. Um, the key thing about level three that you have to remember is if it's not in your scheduling order, if, you're not, if it's not in your scheduling order, you are trapped in level two. So if you don't specifically say each party gets 26 interrogatories in your scheduling order, level two will control and level two will say you only have 25. And it will say you only have 50 hours of deposition because level two has all these fixed things about it that if are not in your scheduling order for level three, you're going to get stuck in level two land. Um, ultimately, the question is, for me, on choosing which one of these, you look at the complexity of your liability and you look at the size of your damage model. You have to consider the number of parties because that, you know, the number of uh, hours of deposition you get, you have to figure that one out. If you've got four parties and each of them's going to, you think, oh, I got to talk to, you know, at least three people over on each side, you're going to run out of time real quick. Consider also uh, whether or not you need expert witnesses. The nature of liability will determine whether you need a rebuttal expert deadline. You really, uh, I keep saying a lot of stuff like this, but it really comes down to, do you know your case and do you have a, a, a a path forward, an outline for what's going to happen in your case. Because the docket control order, the scheduling order, your level, your discovery level will end up controlling that. And if you know what it is, you can shape the discovery to go your way on that. Um, ultimately, one of the things, ultimately it comes down to do a gut check. Do you have the time, energy, and effort and is it the right case to commit to an accelerated level one schedule? Are you ready to be bold? Do you, or do you need to look at a level three scheduling order because one, the complexity of the case, but two, perhaps you're in a very large firm or you have a very complex docket and you need the space and time to do things right. A lot of this comes down to you and your ability to do the work. And so in addition to the facts of the case and the damage model, you have to do a gut check. Can I commit to this? Can I do this? Can I do it in the time that needs to be done? Um, so I want to go ahead then to turn to some examples of scheduling orders. So if we go to the next one, this is a level one pretrial scheduling order. You look at me like I'm crazy because, oh, all the dates and stuff are in the book already. Right. The best practice in my mind is to tie those dates, those deadlines in the, in this, in the, the rules of procedure 
to a specific date and time and enter a scheduling order. Comply completely with the rules of level one, otherwise you arguably may be in a level three scheduling order. But I have found that both sides appreciate rather than having to calculate discovery ends nine months after the first discovery is certain, it ends on this day, it ends at this time. Also, if you look at the, the PowerPoint here on number seven, where it says discovery, Take, you, you take all of the limitations in level one and you put them in, the, in the, the scheduling order because there are some options in level one about, well, you get six hours of deposition, but you get 10 if the court says you, it, it can or the parties agree. Go ahead and put that agreement to do 10 in. I didn't on this one, but I do now in the new ones. Um, there are other things that you can make sure that are understood about discovery and are in this scheduling order signed by the court so there is no confusion. Going to the next one, this is a level three scheduling order. It looks shockingly like my level one scheduling order because one, I've, I've, I've gone through and thought about what I wanted to do in both cases, but this is what is going to structure and control your case. And because of that, you want to make sure it is as complete. It is at, um, in both level one and level three. You want them to be specific and complete. Boy, have I gone to scheduling order hearings about rebuttal expert designations. Um, that seems to be a point of friction for a lot of people, um, but they most of the time get in. Um, you, if, if you know the nature of your case and you know what your schedule is going to be, make it detailed, make it specific, pick your mediator, limit your discovery, do whatever you need to do in that order and get it going because that's the gateway to your lawsuit. So that's what I've got on that. I think we've gone over, Andy gave us a, a good summary of these and he may have touched on both these points already. Uh, at the top, uh, you know, we've, we've got this question of whether you want to send discovery in your petition. It's, it's a very common practice uh, to do it, especially with disclosures. Um, and in some PI cases, you'll see it uh, done with ROGs and RFPs also. Uh, but if you're in level two, you're starting that clock. So you're by, by sending it uh, with your citation, uh, you're saying nine months from now, uh, plus 50 days, we're going to be done. Uh, and, and that's something you need to put on your calendar because you don't want to go back to the court 11 months from then, uh, not having completed the discovery that you need. Uh, the other uh, thing at the bottom half of this slide that we've discussed is the, the catch-all. Uh, it, it's in the style of an RFP, uh, but level one allows for a request for disclosure that says, give me everything. And, and that's an incredibly powerful tool. And uh, some defendants aren't ready for it. Um, you're, you're limited to your $100,000 recovery in level one, uh, but it's, it's something that you can use to, to effectively navigate a smaller case. All right. uh, on the next slide, um, there's the issue of the rule 193.7 notice. Uh, the rules require that you give opposing counsel advance notice if you're going to use their discovery materials against them. Some people put a catch-all uh, in just kind of general language that if you turn something over to me in discovery, uh, I plan on using it against you. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt to put that in your petition uh, from the outset. It's, it's crossing your T's and dotting your I's before you may know that those letters exist later on. Uh, on to the next slide, we've got the identification of damages. So rule 47 uh, deals with a couple different issues. You know, it, it talks about notice pleadings. Texas is a notice pleading state. You basically have to give a short statement of cause of action and give the other side fair notice of what your lawsuit's about. Uh, it's important to confirm that you're within the jurisdictional limits of your case. Otherwise, somebody like Amanda is going to come and try and ruin your day. Um, then you've got to include your damage ranges. Uh, this is hugely important, as we'll talk about in a later slide. You may not be confined to these later. Um, you, you can change, uh, but it is absolutely important to mention them in your petition. Uh, you, can, you can get spiked if you don't. 
Uh, uh, and I'll just throw in for that, uh, like from on the defense, I only do defense work, but that's one of the main things that I look for in all of the petition. I, I have, you know, a, a checklist essentially of things that I make sure are in every petition. That is something that's always on that list. So uh, as Adrian was saying, make sure that you plead it clearly and have your, uh, your range expressed, including the maximum amount sought. Okay, and, and here we get to that spiking issue. Um, the, it's a relatively new rule uh, in, in the context of the broader legal history of this country, but a party that fails to comply with Rule 47C uh, by list specifying their damage range uh, may not conduct discovery until they, they comply. Uh, I actually used this in a, a defense case once to prevent giving discovery to the other side for probably more than six months. Told, told them overtly, you're, you're not entitled to it. They didn't believe it. And, and that made it a lot harder for them to prosecute their case. Uh, eventually they got zero dollars. Um, but follow the rules. It's, it's real important. And you, you may be surprised uh, by what happens when you don't. Okay. Uh, the identification of parties and method of service. This is, uh, we, we've got rules on what you've got to do here, but the practical implications of this are a lot more important. The, the reason why I'm such a stickler on the identification of these things, and sometimes even underline the, the name of the person being served, including whether it's a registered agent, is because I want the clerks to get the citations right. Make their job easier for them. Um, there's another issue on here, but the last three numbers of a human's driver's license number and their social, uh, the, the statute requires it. Um, I don't necessarily see this uh, enforced across the board. I, I don't think I've ever seen somebody put up a real fight about a plaintiff not putting it in here, but know that the rule exists and uh, you'll look better in front of a judge uh, when, when you demonstrate that you are crossing your T's and dotting your I's, uh, even when nobody's really objecting. It, it helps demonstrate your confidence and, um, you know, a Baylor lawyer like Andy will, uh, um, you know, feel better about themselves, right? Absolutely. Every day, all the time. <laughs> Venue. Uh, this is something that Amanda may be uh, a lot better suited to talk about because it's, it's the kind of thing that if you get wrong, uh, she's going to come after you for it. Adrian is completely right. This is uh, another one of those things that's on that checklist that I always look at. So, um, you know, generally you're, well, the, first off, the, uh, the burden on establishing the proper venue is first on the plaintiff. You'll plead it in the petition and um, in section 15.002, that's almost always where the venue will be. Um, that's, in my cases, that's about 90% of the time. I, I think that everyone who's watching is probably aware of those rules. However, uh, there are some other things to keep in mind here. Um, if you have multiple defendants in a lawsuit, the, um, if you would have venue on, on one defendant, you'd have it for all defendants. Venue is determined at the, uh, at the time of of accrual, so look at the, the facts as they exist at the time. If you, for example, if you have a, an, indiv an individual defendant, you want venue in Dallas County, and at the time of the subject incident, the defendant lived in Dallas County, but then a year later when you're filing the lawsuit has moved to, uh, to Tarrant County, um, you would choose Dallas County, or you could choose if you wanted Dallas County, which is generally considered a, a more favorable venue for, for plaintiffs. Uh, while this general rule of, of, from 15.02 applies, there are some mandatory rules which you should be aware of. The mandatory rules will always trump the general rules on venue. If you have cases, I won't go into detail on them, um, it would take too long, but if you have cases that deal with land transactions, uh, landlord-tenant disputes, libel, slander, invasion of privacy, 
uh, Federal Employers Liability Act, inmate litigation, um, a major transaction with agreements that, um, that exceed a million dollars, uh, injunctions, uh, and head of state and suit against county, all of those have specific mandatory venue provisions that will say exactly where your uh, suit has to be filed. There are also permissive venues. Um, these, you can find this in uh, subchapter C of section 15 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code. But generally speaking, these are uh, for, for suits against executors, administrators, breach of warranty claims against a manufacturer. So you're going to see that pop up some in, um, in product liability cases. And, um, and then if a suit is based on a contract too, you'll want to look at those permissive venue sections. Amanda, do you mind if I make a comment real quick? Sure. So one of the things I, I would encourage everyone to look at is under 15.002A, number one, a county where events or omissions giving rise to the claim occurred, I would make sure you look at your whole lawsuit. And it's no one's surprise that we're all looking for a more favorable venue if you're filing a lawsuit. Um, look at your whole suit and, and because you may be surprised where venue may lie. For instance, you know, I do medical malpractice and so a defendant may have his office in, you know, Tarrant County, but the surgery was done in Dallas. And so you've got to look at your lawsuit and find out, well, you know what, the surgery that's the subject of this issue, subject of this lawsuit actually happened in Dallas, even though, you know, you might say, oh, well, but, you know, they went to the office in Tarrant County. Da, 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 da. So really look at your whole case and figure out where you might have the opportunity to create an advantageous venue. One of the other fun things you may have to deal with there is the geography of Dallas. You may find that parts of the city of Dallas are in Collin County. You may find uh, the alternative also. Um, you know, Carrollton sits in three different counties. Check your maps. Uh, it's, it's pretty important because you want to spend your time advancing your, your client's case, not fighting over a venue motion. Get it right once. Uh, you'll, you'll thank yourself later. I think we're, there we go, ready for the next one. So, um, facts. I don't know why we put them in quotes, but, you know, facts. Um, when you plead your facts section, there are some kind of nuts and bolts things you got to think about, and then there are some art, you know, artistic things you got to think about. So, Texas is a notice pleading state. This is not federal court where you have to basically give them the blood type of the defendant in order to prove that you've met the Twombly standard. Um, you got to tell them uh, enough that they know, enough that the defendant is aware of what the cause of action is and what evidence might be necessary to um, refute that or prove it. Um, the language of Rule 45B is it consists of a statement in plain and concise language of the plaintiff's cause of action or the defendant's grounds for defense. Um, and you, can, and you can go through that. So while that's the rule, we have to look at what's necessary to move our client's case. And while wanting to comply with the rule, we need to remember that we're hired for our expertise and a dash of our artistry. So moving to the next slide. There are some questions you need to ask yourself before you write your facts section. Who is your audience? If you think this case is gonna be a bench trial, then your audience is the court. And you need to know that this very busy, you need to give this very busy judge the facts they need to form an opinion about the case even before they get to the causes of action section. They need to know what's going on, what is the evidence that's gonna support it, and then they're gonna only get confirmed when you get to the causes of action section. Um, is your audience the opposing party? Not the opposing attorney, but the opposing party. Then you might really want to plead a lot of good facts because sometimes opposing parties realize, oh no, maybe I don't want to go through this. Maybe I was hard-headed in the pre-suit civil nego settlement negotiations. I, they know a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know they knew. It, you can see where this road goes. Um, if your audience is an insurance carrier, um, 
you can decide whether or not, based on how you've dealt with pre-suit negotiations, how many facts you want to put in there. You probably made a really killer demand that has all that stuff in it. And so you're now just getting down to brass tacks to file. That probably just the who, what, when, where, and move on. The one thing you got to make sure, though, is, is that if you're dealing with a unique situation with insurance, you got to make sure you plead enough in the facts section and in the cause of action section to get coverage. If you're t dealing with employees or things like that, some, some policies have employee exclusions, you need to make sure you plead yourself into coverage. Um, one other consideration, if you do have the opportunity to have a bigger case, is your audience the public? Is once this document's filed, is this something that you're you know, hoping WFAA is going to look at and say, oh, that's a story, we should go there? If that's the case, you need to give the reporter what they need to be able to make the story and bring notice to your case. Um, what do you need to say or not say? That's about your audience. But some key points there is I truly believe, except in the, the, the car wreck situation where you're just proving the who, what, when, and where, is the facts section is never time for the use of legal words and legal phrases. Um, you're going to get that in the cause of action section. You're going to get that down in damages. Facts is telling the story of your case, telling what happened and who it happened to, and why your client is the hero of that story. Don't, don't, don't use legal words. Therefore, premises considered, save that for the prayer. You know. Um, one other thing is, what do you need to say? That Again, that goes back to your audience, but that also goes back to um, well, how, how good was your pre-suit pre negotiations? How good was your pre-suit investigation? What do they know? What do you know? What do you want them to know? And when do you want them to know it? That's, that's something you've got to figure out as well. My, I'm giving it, giving it to you all, and so all the defendants are going to come back at me with it. But my, my strategy is always to, you know, fortune favors the bold. Tell them what you know. Tell them everything you know, within reason. Um, but that way they can really see, especially in certain cases where you might face a motion to dismiss, the judge can look at that and say, yep, this is a real thing. The defendants can say, oh, yep, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. And everybody starts taking you a little bit more seriously. So I think a robust facts section is key. So you've, who is your audience? What do you need to say? Then you need to figure out how do you say it. And so everybody is taught in law school, well, we've got to comply with the rules and, here, and you got to write these things. And so we get trapped in the world of words. You can also use pictures. Everything's e-filed now. Courts, courts are looking at these pleadings on their iPads and iPhones. And so words and pictures are powerful. So go to the next slide. This is a words pleading, a fact section. This was in a case where I represented a woman who had a, had a employee of a store to, uh, take his cam camera phone, put it underneath her skirt and take a picture of it massively inappropriate, massively invasive, um, but that's not something you really want to show a picture of. So you really need to take the time and use words, pull quotes from evidence that you've got to really show what happened and to tell that story in words. Words will really matter here because pictures would, be not, would not be appropriate. But going to the next slide, Sometimes pictures are appropriate. This is from pleading in a case we've got going on in New Mexico right now where a very troubled man came into a, a public place and killed a number of people. Um, he lived in a home that had a veritable arsenal inside it. Um, and so it's one thing to list the, the veritable arsenal. It's another to actually see what that means. And the other key part about this kind of picture and using pictures to emphasize your points and pleadings is, is that anytime someone's going to move for summary judgment on you, they're invariably going to attach, attach the petition unless they do by reference. And so if that petition's on there, this picture's going to come up again and again and again and again. And that's a persuasive thing if you've done it correctly. If you have a picture of a happy face, well, then that's not going to help you out. But if you've used pictures appropriately to tell your story, that's going to be very powerful. Go to the next slide. And sometimes you just got to use a picture because nobody's really knowing what's going on here. This was a case involving a retro Perry bulbar block. But if I show you a picture that's sticking a needle in your eye, you're going to get it. You're going to get it real fast. And so pictures can be used to elaborate what is what the words say, 
to be very impactful, not only to get an emotional reaction, but also to get across what you're trying to say, get across the information. And the, those I think are underused and could really be used to more effect if you include pictures. Now, the, the downside, not the downside, but the thing I wanna caution you is, is that this is a legal document, it is a formal document, it is something we need to take seriously. So the nature of your imagery needs to be compliant with that. Again, you, emojis and happy faces are not the way to go here. But a powerful image that demonstrates what you're trying to prove in a respectful manner, I, I think you could use to great effect. So next slide, please. Some other things that I think you need to consider when you're pleading the facts section, what discovery do you need? I know that the rules of procedure say that the, uh, the discovery is tied to, the, the scope of discovery is tied to the pleading and that generally we think that means causes of action. A robust facts section really will widen that scope to a point where it would be relevant, would be appropriate because if you're looking at a situation where you say, okay, well, one thing happened at one place, but then you learn in discovery that the company didn't have, you know, this safety measure across all of its locations and you plead that and that's in your petition, that's out there, your discovery just got, your discovery scope just got widened. That there's a bigger problem here that the discovery from there will be relevant in your case. So a robust facts, facts section really can guide the scope of discovery especially when you're dealing with cases like negligence. You know, negligence is a very broad, wide kind of thing. I know, and you know, you can do it in breach of contract, mal illegal malpractice, um, fiduciary duty. Facts will widen that scope in, a, in, in an advantageous way for your client, and I think in a, a way compliant with the rules. Um, the last question you want to ask yourself when you file is, are you planning to amend? You don't want to write a petition at the outset that you know you're going to have to amend right off the bat. You want to really give a good shot at it. Um, and so you need to consider whether or not one pleading that you don't need to amend is going to be good enough, or if this is something that's going to be constantly amended. You kind of got to balance that question of, am I going to look like an idiot when I'm filing plaintiff's 12th amended petition? Or is that something that needs to happen in this case? And that's how you know, that's whether or not the complexity of your case supports that. So make that consideration. So next one, please. Yes, and so uh, along with the facts section and, and including enough detail when the case warrants it, as, as Andy was saying, you need to, as a plaintiff's attorney, you need to be careful and mindful of the facts that you're saying. On a number of occasions, I've had the opportunity to either in, um, in written motion practice or in oral argument, I've been able to cite something that plaintiff's counsel said in their petition to support my argument. So uh, just be aware that everything that you say in that petition is, uh, is something that you'll be held to to a certain extent. Of course, you can amend your petition, but, um, but be mindful of that. It's one of my favorite things to do at a hearing when I can say, well, look, plaintiff's counsel said this in, in their petition and, um, and I can hand it as an exhibit to the judge. Uh, also, you are, we, and we might discuss, it, we're discussing it on this slide actually. Uh, so the signatures of the attorneys constitutes um, that they're, they're saying that they're telling the truth. Uh, and, and it's not baseless what they're saying in their petition. So it's, you have to, again, be very mindful as a plaintiff's attorney when you're drafting the petition of what you're saying and, and be aware that someone like me as a defense attorney might cite what you're saying and say, look, you signed it, you, you signed that you looked into this and this is a true fact and it's actually something that supports my argument later down the line. Um, the petition should not be baseless. It's not a license to just make up facts and say what you want to say. I rarely have, I rarely see petitions where I think that that's being done, uh, where it's where it's completely groundless. Um, but sometimes I do. And, um, and when that happens and it costs my client a substantial amount of money to defend, it's, it's going to upset my client if it's, if it is abundantly clear um, that, that the 
the facts were false from the start and expect a sanctions filing later down the line for conduct like that. Um, and we can go on to the next slide now. Okay, this is really dealing with alternative pleadings, uh, and, and it really is the appropriate time to talk about it right after Amanda's discussion of, um, you know, a fact section. You're allowed to plead in the alternative. You're allowed to plead things that aren't consistent so long as you do it in the alternative, but you don't want to bring that up late. Uh, be be open with the court. Be open with your opposing counsel. They're saying, we're, we're coming after you for these things, and, and I may not be able to get both of them. Um, but, but through the course of this process, uh, we're going to make it to the truth. But if you do not praise it as being in the alternative, then what you've stuck yourself with is a contradiction. And Amanda's going to come in and, and get one or both of those claims tossed out. Um, she, she can go up there and say, both of these cannot be true. Uh, let's make this case easier. And she's going to win on that. Um, but because, you were supposed to read your whole petition. You were supposed to sign it only after confirming that everything in there was true and consistent. All right, moving on to the next. Uh, the prayer, this is, we, we get this from rule 21 and, and rule 47. Tell the court what you're asking for. Um, th this is particularly important um, in the context that the case breaks the easiest way it can. Your defendant defaults. If you haven't asked for everything that you want, you're not going to get the default that you want if the defense falls flat on their face or doesn't show. Uh, it's You're not going to get it if you don't ask for it, so make sure that you do. And it's, it's not necessarily as easy as telling the judge at a default hearing, well, can we get this too? If the defendant wasn't on notice for it, then no, you can't. I think a good point here, too, uh, just to piggyback off of what you were saying, Adrian, is if you forget to put something in your original petition and you don't amend, we, we all get busy and usually your first petition is very thorough. But if plaintiff's counsel forgets to amend, it comes time to trial and you haven't listed a claim for damages for mental anguish or uh, future physical impairment, you know, something like that, then... Um, then defense counsel is going to argue that you're not entitled to that relief. You've never pled it. So it, it is very important to look at that section. Discovery will be tailored from the defense side uh, to an extent based off of what is in this, the, what types of damages are pled. Um, and uh, so it's, it's just good to be mindful of those things. And I would just offer that, um, Having heard this, ask the court for what you want and make sure you get everything in there. You do have to make sure, though, that um, you don't plead for everything and the kitchen sink. You got to you got to make sure that what you're asking for, because even though it's a even though in the best way possible, you get a default. Yeah, courts will look at you and say, and we want, you know, and we want their land and we want their house. And, you know, they're, you know, you, you, you're not going to be able to get that. So you need to make sure you stay within the realm of reasonable and you need to make sure that you, it's really tied to your facts, your causes of action, really dialed into what this case is truly about. Okay, the attorney in charge. Uh, this is a real interesting one because it's, it's easy to misunderstand this. It's probably in, uh, super common uh, in, in the context of a, a multi-attorney firm for the senior partner to be listed first, but an associate to be doing all the work. It, it happens, we've, we've lived it. Um, but the order that the attorneys are listed on the plaintiff's original petition and, and in turn on, on the response from the defense counsel designates who the lead attorney is. The issue is not who signed the document. The issue is whose name is printed first. So if Andy and I were working a case, even from different firms, uh, we could put Andy first, Adrian second, and Adrian signs above Andy's name, Andy's lead counsel still. And, and that's important because it affects who, who discovery has to be sent to, things like that. Um, you need to be particularly careful of that when, when you are doing something like I just suggested, working with an attorney who does not office in the same firm as you. Uh, you don't want to be surprised by things going on in your case 
because they're all getting sent to somebody else and you didn't pay attention to rule eight. So we'll talk about removal. Sam, you, uh, a, a plaintiff's attorney might file something in state court and, uh, and then I always consider whether or not it's, it's removable and whether or not that's something that I want to pursue. If, uh, if, if defense counsel does remove to federal court, then uh, it, it's, we're no longer looking at notice pleadings. We're looking at the uh, well-pled federal requirements. It's important to be aware too that the, uh, depending on what federal court you're actually in, they all have uh, a lot of particular rules. So it, it's not just uh, write a petition with more detail, um, but, but look over at their, at the local rules listed on their website. And if you have a mentor who has, has experience in that court, talk to uh, that mentor too. So I found that sometimes not absolutely everything is, is listed on the website and it, it is much more complex than a, a state court filing. For, uh, for venue, um, I, uh, again, I, I always look at venue. It's one of the first things I look at when I get a petition. And if I am challenging venue and saying that suit should have been filed, brought somewhere else, then what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll file my motion to transfer venue um, a few minutes before filing my answer. Um, if, if I file the motion to transfer venue, then, um, then I'll, I'll go ahead and set it for hearing. And, um, and then the burden shifts back to the plaintiff at that point to list specific reasons why they think venue was correct and in the first place that venue was set. Uh, and that, that comes into play when, when I specifically deny certain venue allegations. So I'll do that in my motion to transfer venue. I'll say venue is not correct uh, because as plaintiff said in paragraph eight, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll cite that and I'll say that's not true. That's not where this uh, business was incorporated. That's not where the principal place of business is, something like that. Um, if, if I do that, then um, then the plaintiff in a response has to support their venue allegations with things like um, affidavits and attachments to affidavits. Uh, and one thing that, a word of caution, I, I currently have a pending sanctions hearing for this type of issue. I had a, a plaintiff's attorney who wanted suit in, or wanted venue in a, in a certain county and it was very clear that my client had nothing to, it wasn't a proper venue uh, based off of the entities. The, the judge initially said, I mean, we wrap that up right away and then the judge initially said, okay, well, we'll let plaintiff, we'll give plaintiff 30, 45 days to conduct discovery on venue issues, which uh, and then plaintiff's counsel didn't conduct any discovery on venue issues at all and, and still persisted with challenging our, um, our motion to transfer venue and, and motion for summary judgment. We got a, um, we actually got out on motion for summary judgment. The, the venue was eventually transferred, but now I have a sanctions hearing that, um, that is, that was filed earlier and that's pending. So these venue issues, um, just keep them in mind and, and don't get yourself into a situation where you or your client are uh, being asked to pay for $15,000 in, in attorney's fees. Oh, special exceptions. Um, I most commonly do this. Um, I'll, I'll accept if, a, uh, if there's not the max amount listed. Um, and when, when I, after I have specially accepted uh, Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 47 requires the plaintiff to specify the maximum amount sought, uh, just my advice is, is just do that from the start. Uh, don't, don't require me to specially accept and then set it for hearing along with another hearing that I, that, that will have in the case. Uh, from the, from the get-go, list the minimum amount and the maximum amount that you're seeking. Um, 
I also see this come into play quite a bit when someone just throws in a negligence per se claim, but there isn't a statute that's specified. Um, I feel like that, and this is, people can disagree on this some, it's a little bit of a gray area, but in my opinion, um, if you have asserted a negligence per se claim, but you're not as asserting the specific statute, I don't feel like that's noticed to me or my client on, on what you're truly trying to allege. It's, it's too vague. So, um, so I'll always specially accept to that. Um, for mm -hmm. verify, oh, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, sorry, real quick. Um, you've, you've brought up a good point and there's a question from the, the gallery about um, 91A and fair notice. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think Amanda's brought up a lot of good points about, you know, and the per negligence per se is a great example. You say negligence per se, but then you don't cite a statute. You know, uh, arguably under a special exception standard, you may get away with that. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so I think the balancing 91A, fair notice, a federal pleading standard, you really do have to plead enough where you feel confident that even in notice pleading to get over the 91A, you've got to feel confident that you've checked all of your boxes. If it is negligence per se, well, go ahead and plead that statute. If it is, um, you know, if you're a party that you may or may, you may or may not have standing to assert a claim, you know, put in a line there that's about why you have the ability to do that. It may not rise to the federal blood type of the defendant kind of pleading, but 91A, even though they're comparable, it's it's still that it's un baseless in law or fact, and if you know negligence per se in a statute, that's ba that's based in fact. I think you I think that to the answer to the question, I think you've got to plead enough that you feel confident that you've met the not baseless in fact standard, and pay less attention to the federal standard. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. that Ninety one a on a negligence per se as from from a defense point of view. Uh, the, the law is the law, like Andy said. Uh, that, that's not going to be a good look when they pull out that statute in court and it's too late to back out of your attorney fee mandatory shift. Yeah, and we will get a little more into 91A in a moment. I'd like to briefly touch on the Graves Amendment for for those, uh, this, is, this is really for those who do trucking and transport. Um, a, there's a federal law that, and it says that vehicle rental or leasing companies cannot be liable for an accident simply because the rental or leasing company owns the vehicle. Now, the, the rental or leasing company can still be liable for direct negligence claims like negligent um, maintenance or negligent hiring. But if they're not hiring employees and they're not maintaining the vehicles, if this is solely a leasing or rental company that uh, that owns the vehicle and leases it to um, like a, a, a trucking company that specializes in transportation of certain products, then, uh, then they're not a proper party. The leasing company is not a proper party. I, uh, if I've had the opportunity to have some pre-suit negotiations with plaintiff's counsel, I'll explain the the structure of the entities, and I'll even send um, affidavits so that plaintiff's counsel can have some confidence that what I'm saying is true. But uh, so they'll be aware of this. If I haven't had the chance to have pre-suit negotiations and suit is filed and it's listing an improper party, I will then file a verified denial. Uh, I see that come up a lot in the trucking and transportation world. So uh, be aware of the Graves Amendment. Okay, so we've touched on um, 91A um, just a, a little bit already. This is a 91A motion is um, challenging a groundless petition. It is, uh, the question you should be asking yourself here is when the allegations in the plaintiff's petition are taken as true, is the plaintiff entitled to relief? You're not asking, like, like as a defendant, you're not challenging the allegations. You're assuming that they're true, and then you're saying, like, if all of these things are true, is there even a claim that is, is left? Adrian already touched earlier on the mandatory attorney fee provision, so I'll, uh, I'll skip over that and, and we can go on to the next slide. 
So uh, motions for summary judgment, make sure that uh, when you're drafting your petition, you're not inviting a no evidence motion for summary judgment. I can file that directly with my answer. And there's, uh, unlike an, a traditional motion for summary judgment, I don't have to wait. So, uh, so I'll, um, I will, I'll, I can file the, the no evidence or, or the, the traditional motion, excuse me, I, I flipped that earlier, but I can file the traditional motion for summary judgment uh, as soon as uh, as that petition is filed. I, I can file my answer, file the traditional MSJ. If I can affirmatively prove that what you're saying isn't true, make sure you have a petition that uh, isn't inviting that. And, and that works. Um, you know, I, I do plaintiff side litigation, but every once in a while, one of my clients gets sued and will step in there. And, and we've done that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll file an answer with a 91A and an MSJ, and, and it's a real surprise, especially uh, when we know the suit's coming, and, and file it on the day they serve the suit. Um, it, that makes somebody else need to be real ready to prove up their claims. So mm -hmm. as, as a plaintiff, uh, if, if you know that your defendant's aware of what's going on, uh, be ready for the counterpunch. Yeah, it, it can come up in a number of contexts, but I've seen it actually the most um, in statute of limitation contexts. Uh, I, I wouldn't have assumed that before I had a few years of practicing, but that's where I see it come up a, a few times a year, and I'll just file that with my answer. Uh, we can also, as defense counsel, file affirmative claims and, and counterclaims. So as a plaintiff's attorney, when you're deciding whether to accept a case or not, you should think about that um, and think about whether it's worth filing a petition. I don't know if, uh, if Adrian or Andy want to jump in on, on that part, but uh, I do think it's something that should at least be considered before a petition is filed. No, counterclaims, I think, are a function of the nature of the dispute. Um, I, you know, a counterclaim in a personal injury case is almost unheard of. And when they are, they're really kind of weird. Um, but in your business context, I'm sure Adrian can talk all about this. They're probably going left and right because, you know, you didn't perform under the contract. Well, you didn't do this and you did. It's a, you know, and so I think the consideration whether you're going to get a counterclaim really goes back to what is the nature of your dispute and what is the complexity. I think that if you're filing personal injury matters, you're, it's unlikely to get a counterclaim unless there's something else going on here. No, that, that's fair. And Andy's right. I, I do deal with that in business. You know, it's, it's no fun to be on the, the defense side of the V, especially when you don't have insurance coverage uh, and are having to pay your own way. So uh, it's, it's not uncommon at all for defendants to say, yeah, we're, we're happy to see if we can win something out of this suit too. And, and if you've taken a case on a contingency and are expecting 30 or 40 percent of a recovery, it's not real fun when your entire claim gets netted out by the other sides. Uh, Forty percent of zero uh, is not a pretty number after you put in a ton of work. Okay, we're on to mechanics of filing, and we're getting pretty close to the end here. Um, we'll, uh, I think Sherry's uh, offered to to shoot out this to copy of this to people who are requesting it. Um, but, but this is another one of those things that's not found in the rule book uh, and, and really made this presentation necessary. The things that, that people won't teach you. Um, you need to get an e-filing account. It's, it's mandatory these days. Uh, I actually went to a hearing where somebody tried to submit uh, a defensive pleading on paper and the court turned it down. And they, they later said, well, judge, I tried to turn it in five times uh, the, the judge wouldn't take it. Um, you know, that's, that's not my fault. And the judge said, yeah, it is. It's, it's in the mandatory part of e-filing. Um, it's a, um, an amusing and sad transcript. Uh, get it right. Get your e-filing account. Um, here we've got a link where you can do it. Um, you need to set up your payment account with them. Uh, it, it's not free to file lawsuits unless you're doing it through DVAP or another uh, pro bono provider. Um, I, I recommend that you set up both. Go, go do some DVAP work. Um, create that account there on your e-filing service that says I'm, I'm doing this for free. Then you, you register your credit card or your firm's credit card with there uh, and make sure that you can pay the, the cost to get your suits filed. Um, on the next slide, actually getting service. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, make it easy for the clerks 
to, to draft a citation. You don't draft your own citations. The clerks do, but they need to get the information from somewhere. So put it clearly in your petition at the beginning in the identification of the parties. Uh, underline it to make it easy for them to get there. Uh, it does happen where a clerk will get the names of the parties wrong. You don't want that. You don't want defective service. Uh, so make sure that they get it right the first time. Uh, and it, it also helps your process server in terms of getting them to the right place. In terms of the process servers you use, I prefer going private. Um, you can get a constable to do it, but you'll run into some different issues. You know, if, if you're filing a suit uh, in, in a JP court, um, sometimes your defendant doesn't live in that JP court. The constables are only allowed to operate within their jurisdiction. So you may have filed in precinct four, but your defendant lives in precinct two. That means you've got to get the citation ordered, get it shipped to one constable's office, who will then ship it to another constable's office. It creates a bunch of logistical nightmares that you're not going to want to deal with. The private party service will be cheaper than all the time you lose dealing with the constables. Um, uh, businesses fail to maintain registered agents. There are mechanisms for that. Know that you can go serve through the Secretary of State uh, when they haven't done that. If you put it in your petition in advance, then you will not have to amend your petition uh, to have it done that way. Uh, I think that gets us pretty close to the end. Did we have any other questions to field? Um, I see three questions. Um, I'm not sure if everyone answered it already, but um, one of the questions is, it says, I ran into this issue recently. I'm not sure what issue um, she's talking about, but it says, learn that you don't have to respond to discovery until they comply, but when they do amend the pleading and comply, they do not have, a, uh, have to reserve discovery. The clock starts running as of the date of compliance, just an FYI for everyone. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. And then That's we Sarah have- Sarah Michelle on rule 47. I, I, I think she's illustrated the rule uh, well there. Um, so once somebody files their amended petition that, that does outline their damages ranges, uh, the um, other side doesn't have to reserve their discovery again. Uh, the, the new clock starts at the, the date that they've corrected their pleadings. And then we have one more. It says, um, any tips on how to balance fair notice and standards under Rule 91A, particularly as those standards are often compared to federal pleading standards that are much more stringent? Yeah, and I think we, we covered that earlier in our, our talk with uh, okay. Amanda about 91A and uh, that it's groundless and baseless as opposed to maybe 91A, you know, I think the distinction that for federal versus state court is the state's courts that the Twombly Iqbal, you know, which is really kind of weird, even though they compare the two, the standard is slightly different. And so I would focus on making sure you're not groundless or baseless in a 91A motion. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, well, that was great, guys. Thank you, Andy, Adrian, and Amanda uh, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, as a reminder, the course number is 174 on the screen. Again, that's for one CLE credit. Um, and you must self-report in order to obtain that CLE credit. Um, a recording of the program and the PowerPoint will be available in the next issue of the weekly brief. And thank you all for attending today. Anybody ha have any other comments before we leave? All right, well, without further ado, we will end this CLE. Thanks so much.